donating. Keep Please donating. keep donating. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA in Berkeley, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, and online at kpfa.org. That takes us just past the top of the hour. My name is Brian Edwards Teeker. Normally I'm on the air uh, in the morning starting at 7 a.m., but today we wanted to bring you a special presentation straight from KPFA's newest program, Law and Disorder, which airs at 8 a.m. Um, th- this was inspired by the absolutely astonishing amount of attention that the U.S. media gave to the death of a British monarch that seemed to kind of gloss over the long hangover of British imperialism that this world is still wrestling with. We, we thought if we don't do some kind of record correction, who will? So I'm going to hand it off to the producer of Law and Disorder who did this interview, Jesse Strauss. Queen Elizabeth II, head of the British monarchy for more than 70 years, died on September 8th. Elizabeth became the queen in February of 1952, and the ensuing 70-plus years of her life ruled over a worldwide colonial monarchy. She inherited hundreds of years of colonial and imperial power. If you were to spread out over a year celebrations of each country that has declared independence from the United Kingdom, you would be celebrating a holiday once every week. The colonial legacy is strong. We can't hold Queen Elizabeth directly responsible for what came before her, but on today's show, we'll explore the colonial impact of the 70-plus years that Elizabeth was queen and the movements around the world that fought for and in some cases are still working toward independence. Today, we're joined by one of the world's experts on decolonization movements in the past century. Vijay Prashad is a historian and writer and the executive director of the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research. I'd be remiss not to mention that he has a new book out co-authored with Noam Chomsky called The Withdrawal, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan, and the Fragility of U.S. Power. But today we'll turn to his expertise in decolonization movements of the 20th century, which he documented in a 2007 book called The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World. That book was just reissued for a 15th anniversary edition last month. Thanks for joining us, Vijay. It's a pleasure. Great to be with you. Today we're going to kind of take a whirlwind tour of uprising against British colonial rule during Queen Elizabeth's reign, which started in 1952. But before we step into the tour on a case-by-case basis, I'm wondering if you could reflect a little on the overall role of the monarchy in modern British colonialism and imperialism. Well, you know, where does one even begin? I mean, the British Isles, very small part of the world, just off the coast of Europe, um, relatively inconsequential for most of its history. You know, it's pretty remarkable that they developed the means through perhaps trading first with Europe and so on. They developed the means, a big maritime fleet, to get out there to Asia, uh, to develop a um, slave trade with the Americas and so on, Uh, built an incredibly large footprint around the planet. Again, I just want to emphasize a tiny little island, but an island that was willing, like the Portuguese and the Spanish before them, and to some extent the Dutch, to use you know a great deal of force to subordinate people. Uh, violence was the coin, really. Some people like to emphasize trade, but effectively violence played an enormous role. And the British were able to subdue large parts of the world. There's a hideous record of this subjugation, which includes you know the forceful growing of opium in India, which was then really forced into the Chinese market. The Chinese in the 19th century kept trying to push back and say, we don't want to buy this opium, which the British were having Indian peasants grow. Um, So the British fought two wars to force the Chinese to uh, buy the opium. By the way, these are known as the opium wars. So it's not even like anybody tried to hide the origin of these wars. Massive financial infrastructure grows around the the trade in opium, including some of Britain's largest banks and, you know, uh, company houses, what were known as company houses like Jardines, banks like Barclays and so on. There were some people from the United States who also made their wealth in the opium trade, the Astor family from New York, the Forbes family, which, of course, publishes the Forbes magazine. Uh, Essentially, they all made their money in the opium trade. It's really interesting. 
not much is made of, of the colonial history's role in some of these kinds of brutalities, not just, you know, the massacres of people here, there and everywhere, Jallianwala Bagh, 1919, but also in the structure of the world economy that was created, you know, the use again of immense force to subordinate China, uh, which had been an economy uh, roughly the same size and dynamism of Europe was basically put to its knees through this uh, insistence that the Chinese people buy opium. I mean, the heart of colonialism was in this. And, you know, the family of, of uh, the Windsors, which is Queen Elizabeth II's family, uh, was rooted in all of this. I mean, you know, they had a long imperial tradition and history. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I know that in the aftermath of, of uh, the fall of the Soviet Union, and in particular when the United States uh, goes into war with Iraq for the second time in 2003, there was a way that colonialism was being uh, addressed as if to say there was a good side to it. You know, this happens periodically, but this is a cycle that opened up with books um, written by people like Niall Ferguson and others saying the United States needs to learn about colonialism from the British um, and colonialism is a good thing, but in fact, when you look back at the actual history of colonialism, it's steeped in an ugliness that's unimaginable for most people uh, who, who don't see these things carefully. I want to shift our conversation to the time of the actual Queen's reign. And of course, we're not going to have time to talk about every single colonial experiment that the Queen was involved with because there were so many during her reign. But I'm wondering if we can start with the first rebellion once she was in power. That would be the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya beginning in the early 1950s. In your book, uh, The Darker Nations, you wrote that the British policy sought to exterminate rather than contain the rebellion. And in the interim, it energized the most vicious settler racism. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Mau Mau uprising in Kenya? Well, you know, um, after World War II, there was an attempt by many countries to seize the fact of British weakness, because after all, uh, Britain had suffered a serious blow, um, you know, from the Blitz and then the fight uh, to subdue Nazism, uh, not as serious a blow as the Soviet Union had suffered, which lost, you know, over 20 million citizens in that battle against the Nazis. But Britain had, had suffered a great deal. Um, now, I would like to say one thing about that. A great favorite of people um, in this period is to talk about Winston Churchill. I, I just like to put on record that as a consequence of World War II, Winston Churchill personally diverted food from an area of Bengal, a place where I was born some decades later. Um, and in that region, not far from where I was born in Calcutta, in East Midnapur district and so on, um, between one and three million people died in, 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 in a, a big act of, uh, of starvation uh, by the British state, by the imperial state, because they diverted food to feed the troops. Um, this is a, um, well, I don't know what to call it. I don't want to use the word Holocaust because that's misunderstood. Um, this is a case of mass starvation, uh, which was done as part of British policy. You know, this was not as a consequence of nature or anything like that. Um, Churchill will, of course, later become a great favorite, not only of the royal family, but of prime ministers over and over again that would talk about Churchill as a great ex exemplar. Anyway, at the end of World War II, um, Britain was greatly weakened and a number of countries that had been colonized um, put on the table their independence. Of course, most famously, India and Pakistan independent in 1947. Um, in On the African continent, this energy was very much on the table in the Gold Coast, led by Kwame Nkrumah, a real push uh, for that country to achieve its own independence uh, from Britain. And eventually, in 51, the process begins. A few years later, it will uh, come to fruition when Kwame Nkrumah is, um, made the first head of government of an independent Ghana, uh, comes out of the British colony, the Gold Coast. Well, in Kenya, similar energy is on display you have an amazing, uh, you know, emergence of a mass struggle for independence. And it needs to be said that this struggle goes back right to the 1920s. You know, it, it's not a struggle that 
um, starts after World War II. It's a very old struggle. It matures in the 1930s. This struggle um, forms into a uh, demand for higher wages against, you know, the Kipande, the identity document that the British imposed upon um, the Kenyan people and so on. Uh, and so that uh, struggle, which starts in the 20s, escalates. And in the immediate period after World War II, um, there is a attempt by um, the Kenyans to, again, put their views on the table. This is suppressed by the British, and the Kenyan people enter into an armed rebellion. It's called the Mau Mau. Now, what's interesting is the British basically treated the Mau Mau um, not as an independent struggle, but as a kind of savage rebellion that needed to be put down savagely. It's important to say that because, you know, it would have been quite easy to understand the Mama Rebellion as a civic rebellion, as an attempt by the people in Kenya to uh, assert their right to independence. Slight difference between Kenya and Ghana, or the Gold Coast, was that in Kenya there were a large number of white settlers, British settlers who had settled there. There were very lucrative plantations and so on. They didn't want to move. Um, and the British, in some respects, both in Kenya and then in Malaya, both plantation economies with a settler population, both of these places, they simply did not want to negotiate independence. So you had horrible violence in both Kenya and in, in Malaya. For many years, we didn't actually know the depth of, of the violence. And, and I say one reason we didn't know about the extreme violence used by the British, despite the fact that uh, Kenyan writers themselves told these stories, was that the British authorities suppressed the archive. In fact, a lot of documents had been destroyed um, shortly after the uprising had been put down. Um, that doesn't change the fact that some documents remain. And during the emergency period in the 1950s, while um, Queen Elizabeth II was on the British throne, uh, Carolyn Elkins, a professor at Harvard University, estimates that perhaps up to 300,000 people were killed um, in crushing that rebellion. And, you know, very sadly, I mean, these are, look, without a doubt, these are war crimes, without a doubt. But very sadly, I must say, uh, there was very little, um, you know, understanding in England of what had happened. And it took till 2013. Can you imagine? This is the 1950s. 60 years later, the British government finally acknowledged uh, the, the terrible violence done to people and there was some cash payment dispersed among the um, those who had claimed that they had been or their families had been affected by the British emergency. Um, so that's the Mau Mau. I mean, it is emblematic of um, the, the amnesia that we have, that we assume that once the war ended and this decolonization process went along, that somehow the British, you know, peacefully dispersed their colonies. Not true at all. And in fact, not even true in India. Uh, we often forget that in the during World War II, there was crushing violence imposed upon the Indian people when they attempted to uh, get their independence. And even the uh, departure of the British, you know, was done through great violence by dividing the Indian subcontinent into India and Pakistan, occasioning the transfer of 13 million people, uh, one million of whom died in that uh, in that partition you know population transfers by the way illegal by international law but in fact uh, entirely made normal by the british policy um, in the transfer in the the partition of india in 1947 you're listening to law and disorder on kpfa we're in conversation with historian and author vj prashad Let's move into the 1970s now. These are some of the countries that decolonized from British rule in that decade. Zimbabwe, previously known as Rhodesia under British rule, gained independence in 1970. Sierra Leone, Qatar, and Bahrain gained independence in 71. Sri Lanka, known as Ceylon, became a republic in 1972. Malta in 74. Trinidad and Tobago in 76. Now, I specifically want to ask you about uh, Rhodesia and Zimbabwe. Can you tell us a little bit about that decolonial process? Yeah, it's so interesting that the name of the country, um, the 
previous colonial name of the country is a name of a person. I mean, how repulsive is that? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, and 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 you just said Rhodesia, but there's also there's South Rhodesia and North Rhodesia. It's not just Zimbabwe, also Zambia. I mean, something repulsive that in world history we can have a large part of the world named after one person who's not even from there. You know, this is Cecil Rhodes, a British. Um, man who was given license by the crown of his day to essentially go and conquer a part of the African continent and um, name it after himself. I mean, it's a grotesque. It's a grotesqueness by itself. Britain held Rhodesia, which they treated again as a settler colony, similar to um, Kenya. Large number of British people migrated to today's Zimbabwe, then Rhodesia, and you know had large farms controlled sections of the nascent industry, but really the, the struggle was in, in, in agriculture. They owned large, enormous farms, um, you know, uh, and they controlled the economy uh, and they brutalized the population. I mean, they treated the people essentially as field hands, indentured labor and so on. Th those Africans who lived there were not treated as humans at all. You know, there was a kind of apartheid system in Rhodesia uh, without the name apartheid, you know, um, and so that was the situation. Just as in 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 Kenya, and when the people started to make claims uh, for themselves, saying, "Listen, we want to have our own lives, our own dignity. We want to build our own world, as it were." Um, the British fought back against them ruthlessly. I mean, look, there's a great film made by a Swedish filmmaker called "Concerning Violence" about. Um, the book by Franz Fanon, which I had mentioned, there's a scene shot contemporaneously with the um, with the liberation movement in Zimbabwe, where one of the settlers is asked about the liberation movement, and he said, "We would prefer to destroy our land than to hand it over um, to our servants." Effectively, I mean, isn't the attitudes are incredible that people have there? Well, okay, so it's interesting because. Well, what's the role of the British in terms of, of Rhodesia? Because technically Rhodesia was, you know, an independent place. So what was the, the situation there? Um, well, you see, the British played a duplicitous game here. Because on the one hand, there was an independent government, uh, the government of Ian Smith. And you had the British government saying, we are trying to pressure Ian Smith to behave better. On the other hand... Britain was the principal backer of Ian Smith's government. So it's not like, you know, Britain was like playing some liberal role. They played a duplicitous role in, in that situation. Well, of course, you know, when people are struggling against all odds to fight against a colonial power like in Rhodesia, backed by the West and so on, you had two, three, maybe four different fronts. You had, um, you know, the ZANU-PF, for instance, the largest one led by Robert Mugabe, they were backed by the Soviet Union and other countries, including Cuba. Um, and they fought essentially an armed struggle against the Ian Smith government. Uh, eventually, when the Ian Smith government had to fall and there was elections in uh, what would become Zimbabwe, uh, ZANU-PF won the election. And you might want to know, just on a side note, by the way, that the British monarchy sent a representative uh, to Harare for the ceremony when Robert Mugabe took the oath of office. And that representative at that ceremony was now uh, Charles III. Uh, he went, uh, you know, carrying essentially the authority of, of his mother, the queen. Well, um, the moment you had this government in Zimbabwe in place, the entire apparatus of the British state turned against it, including uh, the British Broadcasting Corporation, which from 1988 till almost the present day, has taken an adverse position uh, against the government in Zimbabwe. And what? why did they take this adverse position? Because, remember I said that the settlers in Rhodesia had basically control of all the land, and the people, the Rhodesian people or the Zimbabwean people, had no control over the land. So what the government of ZANU-PF did, uh, of Robert Mugabe, was that they conducted wide-scale land transfers um, you know, initially to people who had fought in the independence struggle, and then they basically started to expropriate land from the big white farmers. Well, this 
a process which continued from 1980 right into the 2000s. You know, the, the government kept trying new schemes, uh, willing buyer, willing seller, that was a big scheme in the 1990s and so on. But effectively, any attempt to expropriate the colonial, settler colonial uh, landholders was greeted by the British state and the BBC as some great violation against the rights of property. It's incredible, you know, what kind of world we live in. A world, by the way, where you might be happy to know that slave owners in the island of Jamaica continued to be paid by the British state for the loss of their property, aka human beings, right up till 2010. So that was going on in Jamaica, where the British state was quite happy to pay um, you know, families of former slave owners for the loss of their quote-unquote property. At the same time, as the British state, queen as the sovereign, was out there maligning the attempts in Zimbabwe uh, to somehow create an equity in the land distribution. And you are listening to KPFA, and it's just about 20 minutes past the hour. We're in our fall fundraising drive, so we're cutting into our interview with Vijay Prashad to ask for your support. Vijay Prashad has an encyclopedic mind for histories of colonization and the struggles against it. When I reached out to him, he was more than happy to lend his voice to KPFA. He's done it before with me, and he's done it before for a variety of shows on this station and the Pacifica Network. He made himself available for this conversation about the legacy of British colonialism and rebellion against it since the reign of Queen Elizabeth after she died because he believes in this network. It's the same reason that myself and my co-host for this hour, Brian Edwards Teekert, are here, and it's the same reason that you, our listeners, are here. And as we're working on the day-to-day operations of the station, we need those reminders. It would mean so much to us if you can give us another reminder right now by donating in our fall fundraising drive. The premium we're offering in this hour is Vijay Prashad's pivotal book about decolonization in the third world. It's called The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World. And it's part of the official People's History series with an introduction by Howard Zinn. The book originally came out in 2007, but it was just reissued in August for a 15th anniversary edition with a new introduction by the author. If you make a donation right now by going to our website, that's kpfa.org, and if you donate $100 or more, you can get a copy of The Darker Nations. You'll also receive a link to listen to my full-length interview with VJ, which is too long for us to air in this hour. Make that donation right now by going to kpfa.org and click the donate button or call in to donate right now at 1-800-439-5732. Now, I also want to mention that we have a special package today. If you donate $100 or more, you'll get the 15th anniversary edition of The Darker Nations by Vijay Prashad. We're also offering his newest book, Struggle Makes Us Human, that was released this past summer. Struggle Makes Us Human, the subtitle is Learning from Movements for Socialism. It is a fantastic book. If you donate $175 or more, you'll get the package. You'll get both The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, and Struggle Makes Us Human, Learning from Movements for Socialism. You could donate by going to our website, that's kpfa.org, or giving us a call at 1-800-439-5732. Brian? All right, we've got just 40 seconds till we go back to the interview. Here's one more reason to make the pledge right now. We just got news that Michael and El Sobrante is offering to double $800 if we can match him by the end of the hour. That would be... Ten, uh, eight people, rather, picking up a copy of VJ's book, The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, with a pretty comprehensive uh, rewritten preface by Vijay, Vijay Prasad, uh, taking stock of the last 15 years of U.S. imperial collapse in places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, it's a chance to make what you pledge to KPFA go further. We're out of time to ask you for it. So we're asking you to show your support in whatever way you can. The best way is kpfa.org. We also have every single phone line open at 1-800-439-5732. Right, let's go back to the conversation with Vijay Prashad about the long hangover of British imperialism 
specifically during the lifetime of Elizabeth II. Going slightly back in history, I wanted to ask if if you wanted to speak on the decolonization of Sri Lanka. Yeah, you know, Sri Lanka is interesting. You mentioned the turn of Sri Lanka to a republic in 1972. Of course, Sri Lanka won its independence in 1948. Many countries in the Caribbean today uh, had won their independence in the aftermath of World War II, but, you know, they continued to have uh, Queen Elizabeth II as their head of state, as it were. Um, A good example of that is actually Trinidad and Tobago, and I wanted to say a few things about that. Queen Elizabeth II effectively... uh, Well, well, let's go back. Trinidad and Tobago was a um, colony of the British crown and of the settler planters who ruled it, again, um, ruling it uh, for a long period of its history with people who were not paid for their labor and treated as property. And then they had a large indenture a population come from Asia. Um, well, you know, when Trinidad and Tobago, after its own struggles, won its independence in 1962, it retained the queen, that's Queen Elizabeth II, as the head of state uh, from then, 1962, until um, 1976. And so that's an interesting feature. You know, then subsequent to that, you know, they had remained a member of the Commonwealth. That is, Trinidad continues to be a member of the Commonwealth, where the Queen effectively is the titular head of the Commonwealth. But they, in fact, for a long while had the Queen as their head of state. Many Caribbean islands continue to have the Queen as head of state, but slowly the tide is turning. Uh, While she was still alive, Barbados decided to become a republic. And during the days after her death, Uh, the head of government in Antigua uh, and also in Jamaica have suggested that they will now move uh, to a republic status. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I I want to stay with Trinidad and Tobago for a minute because the first prime minister of Trinidad and Tobago was a very distinguished scholar. His name is Eric Williams. And Dr. Eric Williams wrote a book on capitalism and slavery. What Dr. Eric Williams demonstrated in that book was the enslavement of humans in the Caribbean actually provides the down payment for capitalism. So capitalism in that sense uh, begins in places like the Caribbean. And all the major uh, social advances that took place in a place like England or Britain um, came at the expense of people in the Caribbean. It's a very important argument made by Eric Williams. When he eventually becomes head of government, he is really unable to advance Um, a strategy that would change that, turn that around and allow the um, fruits of of, of, uh, the work of the people of Trinidad and Tobago and their resources to benefit the people there. Uh, That was difficult. Any time a government in the Caribbean attempted to move in a kind of radical direction, such as, say, another former British colony, uh, the colony of Guyana, uh, used to be British Guyana, the, the first Prime Minister of British Guyana, Chedi Jagan, tried to do twice uh, a kind of acceleration of moving the benefits of the work of the people of Guyana for themselves, and he was overthrown in two British coups. In fact, um, British warships entered the Caribbean uh, to remove him from office during the reign of Queen Elizabeth II. This is an event not remarked upon much um, in recent days. So in the Caribbean, it's not only the coup against Chedi Jagan, but simultaneously the attempt to overthrow the government of Fidel Castro, in which British intelligence has routinely played a role alongside the CIA. Um, You have so much, there's so many stories in the Caribbean. Small countries, every time they try to lift their head up. Another example, of course, Grenada, former British colony, 1979, the new jewel movement comes in, Maurice Bishop at the head, United States intervenes. There's, in fact, a marine Uh, invasion by the U.S. government, again, backed fully by British intelligence, they overthrow the new jewel movement. So (laughs) look at that. I mean, during this entire period, um, there's lots of photographs of Queen Elizabeth II visiting various islands. Let me tell you, underneath everything, there's a deep resentment of colonialism, slavery, racism, and so on. And you're going to see now more and more of these island nations Uh, exert themselves like Barbados 
under Prime Minister Mia Motley, uh, like Barbados, they are going to exert themselves and become republics. I'm going to jump in here with a very quick fundraising update before we return to the interview with Vijay Prashad. Um, this is where we kind of hit the panic button and say we need your help. Five minutes ago, we received an $800 challenge. That is one person who can give more than most offering to double contributions from everyone else who comes in this hour. So far, towards that $800 challenge, we have raised zero, nothing. Uh, not a caller on the line in the process of pledging. If there's someone in the process of doing it through the website, I can't see it. Um, we think it's important to bring a conversation like this to attach some actual lived reality for most of the world to the celebrity coverage that has consumed the U.S. media since the death of Elizabeth II. If you agree, we need to hear from you. KPFA.org or 1-800-439-5732. 60 seconds till we're back to the interview. Jesse? Well, yeah, we only have a few seconds, so I just want to mention that our premium for this hour is a book that was so meaningful to me. I read it when it first came out originally in 2007, and I have reread it and reread it and used it as a reference constantly. Uh, the book was just reissued for a 15th anniversary editions. It's called The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World by Vijay Prashad. For a $100 don dollar donation, you'll receive this book alongside the full-length hour interview that I did with Vijay Prashad about British colonialism since the Queen's reign that we don't have enough time to air during this hour. Please call in or go to our website to give us a donation. Let us know that you support us. Let us know that the content we create is meaningful to you right now. Our caller line is empty. We would love to see those phone lines light up. You can go to our website to donate, kpfa.org, or give us a call at 1-800-439-5732. Let's go back to the interview. I want to move our conversation more in the present. Um, it's worth mentioning that the British Kingdom still maintains over 15 Commonwealth realms where the head of the British monarchy, which was the Queen until a few weeks ago and now is King Charles, is still considered the Queen or King. That includes Antigua, Australia, the Bahamas, Belize, Canada, Jamaica, New Zealand, Papua New Guinea, and a bunch more. I'm wondering, Vijay... What does the transition in the monarchy from the Queen Elizabeth to King Charles mean in real terms for these countries? Is it really that Antigua and Jamaica, which you mentioned earlier as stating after the Queen died that they wanted to become independent, were, were they just waiting for the Queen's death to demand independence from the Commonwealth? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, obviously, you'll have to ask them to, to know, and I, I haven't had the time to to make inquiries of that kind. Uh, so uh, you're asking me to, to in a sense, uh, think for them, can't do that. But here's what I can say. Um, you know, Queen Elizabeth II would have been the last monarch uh, of the British yep. imperial tradition who essentially was able to craft her image quite strategically. You know, uh, she didn't have to be the monarch on live television all day. You know, even though during her entire reign, she was on television, but she was not on live television. So one never saw the actual personality of Queen Elizabeth II. She was crafted as this sort of benign figure who, you know, loved people and, and so on and so forth. Well, <laughs> you know, poor old Charles III, he emerges in the age of live everything streaming. I mean, you've already seen him behave appallingly with his staff on several occasions. You know, one... His, uh, well, he's in, in the north of Ireland making a signing declaration. His ink pen leaks and he gets up from the table exasperated and he says, they always do this to me. And I was interested in that little outburst of his because it could be read in two different ways. They always do this to me. Ink pens always do this to me. Or the Irish always do this to me. <laughs> Not sure what he was referring uh -huh. to. But at any rate, you know, I think that He's a less lovable person, if I'm just going to be quite blunt. Uh, even though he has all these, uh, you know, opinions about environmentalism and, and so on, he's a less lovable person. And I think a lot of countries are now like, okay, um, you know, Auntie Queen is dead. 
now let's just abandon ship because we really don't need some rude fellow who gets cross all the time uh, to look up to. We don't need his portrait uh, in our government offices. I think there's a little subjective element to this, you know, um, that we're going to see more and more of Charles's atrocious personality on full display. And I think people in places, you know, like Antigua are just going to say, good God, it's 2022. We have enough problems, rising sea waters and so on. Do we really need to put this guy's picture up in all our offices? Yeah, um, we are in conversation with Vijay Prashad discussing the impact and power of Queen Elizabeth's reign and the British monarchy's reign since her rule. Um, One of the things that you wrote in your book, The Darker Nations, you wrote, the third world bled to make Europe grow. Um, The queen herself, when she died on September 8th, was worth around $500 million. But as queen, she controlled about $28 billion of wealth. On top of that, the royal family in all is said to hold at least $88 billion. In broad terms, Vijay, what does that wealth represent? And with all that accumulated wealth, do you foresee things being different in any way under King Charles? Well, not at all. I mean, look, I was in Ireland. Uh, the Republic of Ireland when she died. And you should have seen the reaction in, in Re- the Republic of Ireland, just next door to, to England, to the realm of, of the British, uh, you know, a queen. And of course, part of the uh, island of Ireland is still under British colonialism. And that's the colonies in the north. So uh, there was a very different attitude, even in Ireland than in the United States. One would have thought, my friend, that the United States, which somehow jettisoned uh, the British monarchy in 1776, would have a more republican attitude to all this. But good God, no. It's almost as if Queen Elizabeth II was the queen of the United States. I mean, a ridiculous Mm -hmm. display of of piety and fealty and so on 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 US television and in the press. Ridiculous, you know, uh, embarrassing even. Uh, Ireland, much closer to to Britain geographically, a uh, much more ruthless attitude, you know. She's just another person who died. I mean, many European countries have kings and queens. You know, Spain has king and queen. Um, you know, most of the Scandinavian countries, Netherlands and so on. So, you know, what makes her any difference? You know, sh- she's just another antiquated, uh, you know, institution that is now fading away. That's the attitude in Ireland. Plus, there's a strong anti-colonial sentiment, Republican sentiment and so on. So that's the first thing I would say. Secondly, you know, in the northern counties of Ireland, the British monarchy owns most of the coastline on the Atlantic side. It's a ridiculous, vulgar amount of wealth stolen from ordinary people, held by a family that is completely dysfunctional. I mean, if you were a Martian and came to Earth and just studied the different families and looked at this family, you know, uh, rapists, child molesters, Um, murderers of various kinds, you know. I mean, extraordinary, you know. Uh, I can't believe that this family is able to, for instance, survive the scandal of Prince Andrew uh, and his relationship to, uh, you know, Jeffrey Epstein and so on. Can't imagine uh, that this is the case. And not only are they still revered ridiculously, but also they hold wealth which they stole. I mean, there is a meme that traveled around social media, a picture of the queen in regalia, which had arrows pointing at different things, you know, different jewels and so on, on her clothes. And they said things like Fiji, Barbados, India, and so on. I mean, there is a popular sentiment in these countries that, you know, you stole our stuff. When are we going to get it back? And I, I think that attitude, stunningly, is not shared in the United States. And one reason it's perhaps not shared in the United States, is that perhaps after 1776, uh, much of the great theft by the British monarchy took place outside the United States. United States is not a place of you know, immense thieving by that monarchy. And secondly, the quote-unquote special relationship developed by the United States and, um, and Britain after World War II was to some extent structured around these sorts of fantasies of royalty. On the one side, it was... Um, the House of Windsor, and then on the other side, it's, you know, different kinds of houses, the House of of the Kennedys, perhaps, or the House of the Bushes, or the House of the Clintons. You know, these are different dynasties uh, in the United States. And somehow this romance developed um, between 
the United States and Britain, and the Queen played a role in this, structuring this romance. You know, um, somehow there was a kind of nostalgia for something that I frankly don't understand, but that's what it is. It's certainly not a nostalgia shared by people in the Caribbean, um, in Africa, or in Asia. And it's just about 20 minutes till the end of the hour. We're going to use our time as tightly as possible to raise money. Our phone lines are empty. We are in our fall fun drive, and we would love it if you could give us a call. Please give us a call right now, 1-800-439-5732, or you could donate at kpfa.org. We are doing our best to keep the station running. We've been doing it since 1949. We've been on the air for longer than Queen Elizabeth II was in power. Now that, I believe, is a feat, and I believe we can outlast the rest of the life of the monarchy. If you call us now and support us, call in, give us your donation. That's 1-800-439-5732, or donate online, kpfa.org. Brian? Listening to an interview with Vijay Prashant, the executive director of the Tricontinental Institute, and we're offering his book, The Darker Nations, which is really a book about the the third world as a project. Um, It was incredibly important when it came out 15 years ago. It has just been released in an updated edition with, with a new preface by Vijay, looking at the last 15 years of U.S. imperial collapse. It could not be more timely. And so we're offering the new edition of The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, for a pledge of $100 at kpfa.org or 1-800-439-5732. You can get it in combination with his newest book uh, called Struggle Makes Us Human. You get both together for a pledge of $175. And whatever you pledge will be helping us towards an $800 challenge that we now have 17 minutes left to make. Uh, So far, we've raised $200, $600 to go, That is a big lift this time of day. We're asking you to pitch in whatever you can to close the gap. KBFA.org or 1-800-439-5732. We're going to take a leap of faith and uh, hope enough of you rally to KPFA's aid to to help us make some progress as we go back to the interview with Vijay Prashad. I want to wrap up our conversation talking about what you referred to as this antiquated model. I'm wondering if you have thoughts about the modern value or importance of the monarchy, not just in this accumulated wealth, but in what's left of the uh, British Empire and the colonies. Does the British state get something out of the monarchy now? Or is the royal family just uh, symbolic and or grifting off the state? How do you see its relationship to global political theater or political action? (laughs) Well, look, it's up to the British people to decide whether they want a monarchy. I mean, that's really up to them. It's a choice they will have to make. Um, And apparently some people argue, although I haven't seen the economic evidence for this, that the monarchy is like a tourist institution. People go to England while they see a play in London They do this, that, and the other. They may go drift along and have a look at Buckingham Palace. I don't know why you need a queen in there to go and look at Buckingham Palace because it's not like tourists get to see the queen, you know, or now King Charles III. They just look at the buildings. So I'm not sure what that argument is based upon. But that, again, that, to be frank, is for the British people to decide. What I think is going to happen, rather than let's talk about Britain becoming a republic, After all, they don't even have a constitution in Britain, you know, because it's a monarchy. Um, They have basically common law. They don't have a constitution. The entire system is governed on the uh, whim of the the monarch. Now, the monarch's whim is now structured into some traditions and so on, but that's a separate issue. What we will see is many of the countries, formerly colonized countries, uh, many of them uh, are going to definitely move away from having the queen be, or the king now, be the head of their state. Uh, that is a trend that we are going to see more of. Uh, when Mia Motley's government took this move in Barbados, um, it set in motion conversations. As I said, two other uh, countries in the Caribbean are discussing this. I think many more will. End of the day, 
you're going to end up with the old white settler colonial states like Canada, Australia, New Zealand. They will remain um, nominally under um, the sway of the British monarchy. But I, I think those in the Caribbean and so on are going to really walk away from this. This is not the future for them. And what of the relationship between the monarchy and political decision making in England and Britain? I ask this both in the context of perhaps speculating in the future, but also thinking about more modern imperial actions. You just wrote this book alongside Noam Chomsky about the invasion and eventual withdrawal of Afghanistan, which, of course, Britain supported wholeheartedly. What are we to say? I mean, you know, uh, Britain, like the United States, has had a real decline in the caliber of its uh, elected leadership. You know, uh, the very fact that somebody like Liz Truss emerges as the leader after Boris Johnson, I mean, it, it should be an embarrassment for the British people. It says something about um, the kind of people that join right-wing parties. You know, um, the people of some talent of the right generally go into business and they sort of leave um, the party structure in the hands of people who are pretty mediocre. And that's what Britain is going to have to live with. You know, uh, look at the train, David Cameron, um, Boris Johnson. I mean, it's embarrassing. L Liz Truss is an embarrassment. There was a meme online which suggested Liz Truss went to meet the Queen and the Queen says, that's it, I'm done. Can't The, the decline is cannot be further than this. I mean, I, I don't want to sit around and have to meet her once a week and talk about affairs of state. I'm finished. Thanks a lot, Charles. It's your turn. Um, you know, I mean, uh, what does it mean? Well, it's got nothing to do with the king or the monarchy in general. It has to do with the deterioration of the caliber of people in politics. I mean, I, I sent a tweet out right after, um, you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth's death. I said that it might actually end up being a fact that Charles III is to the left of Labour Party leader Keir Starmer. That's how bad British politics is. You know, um, the Labour Party under Keir Starmer has drifted into a kind of soft conservatism. And at least dear old boy Charles III, you know, is, is worried about the environment and he's worried about um, the price of housing and so on. Grumpy old fox that he is, at least he seems to hold one or two decent opinions. Can't say the same for the mediocre elected leadership in Britain. That's the voice of Vijay Prashad. I was in conversation with Vijay about the role of British colonialism since the Queen's reign. Queen Elizabeth died on September 8th. She lived, or she rather, she ruled the British kingdom for more than 70 years, but three years shy of how long KPFA has been going strong and giving you programming. We've been around since 1949, and we need your support to keep us going. We are in our fall fund drive, and we're asking you to make a donation right now to support our programming. We even in this hour have an $800 challenge from Michael and Elsa Brani. The $800 challenge means that every dollar you donate until we hit $8, $800 is doubled. Our phone lines, we have one caller on the phone line now and we are anxiously awaiting to see how much they're going to donate. We would love it if you could join them. You could join them by donating on our website at kpfa.org or by calling in at 1-800-439-5732. Five seven three two. The gifts we're offering in this hour is one, the 15th anniversary edition of the Darker Nations, a people's history of the third world by our guest today, Vijay Prashad. If you donate $100 or more, we would love for you to get that gift. Additionally, though, we have this other book by Vijay Prashad. It is called Struggle Makes Us Human, and it's from just this past summer. I read this book, I love this book, and I interviewed Vijay about this book. In this book, Struggle Makes Us Human, Vijay Prashad makes an argument that history zigs and zags, where we consider failed historic movements as experiments that didn't quite go right as opposed to failures. But more important than failures or success, the point here is that the struggle itself is a learning process and a humanizing one. And that's why the book is called Struggle Makes Us Human. It's a conversational exploration of how those zigs and zags of history 
can teach us how to imagine a better world. And I should also say, without spoiling too much, that the better world Vijay Prashad imagines is definitely socialist. You can get that book as a gift, Struggle Makes Us Human, alongside The Darker Nations of People's History of the Third World by going to our website and donating $175 right now. That's our website, kpfa.org, or you can call in to make your donation at 1-800-439-5732. Please do that now, and you can help us meet our $800 challenge goal. Thanks to Michael and Elsa Brani for offering up that challenge. Brian? We've got just a, a little bit over eight minutes to make that $800. We're, we're starting with one caller on the line. And putting a simple proposition to you, do you think there should be a place like KPFA? I was kind of surveying American media over the the course of the the media festivities surrounding uh, the the death of Queen Elizabeth. And um, it was just kind of stunning. If, If you went to our newspapers, they had more stories above the fold about the Queen and her life than British outlets like The Guardian, if you looked at CNN, it was devoting more real estate on the front page of its website than the British broadcasting system. There's something about our infatuation with celebrity that has made us completely abandon our critical faculties in this country. And there's just a few astonishing and important exceptions like KPFA. Um, I, I said at the beginning of this hour... If we don't spend the time going through the legacy of British imperialism and the violent ways in which Britain responded to liberation struggles during the tenure of Queen Elizabeth II, who's going to? And if you put that question to yourself and the answer is, I can't imagine too many places around here doing that, well, then we need you to pitch in so we can keep it going. We're at seven minutes left in the hour. $800 on the line in match money for KPFA, and we're going to need your help to do it. KPFA.org or 1-800-439-5732. You get Vijay Prashant's incredibly important book, The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, for a pledge of $100 or more at KPFA.org or 1-800-439-5732. Combine it with his newest book, Struggle Makes Us Human. Subtitle is Learning from Movements for Socialism. Uh, And you'll get both together at a slightly discounted pledge rate of $175 or more at kpfa.org or 1-800-439-5732. Most importantly, whatever you pledge is going to count towards this challenge. So it's like giving more to KPFA than you are digging out of your own wallet. At this moment, we have raised 440 towards the challenge. That means we have 360 to go. And now we're down to six minutes to do it. Thank you for that call. KPFA.org or 1-800-439-5732. And I would be remiss if I did not say uh, the interview you're listening to is some of the exciting work coming out of KPFA's newest program, Law and Disorder with Couch Brooks, which airs at 8 a.m. Jesse's the producer of that program. And um, we're excited to bring it to the airwaves. We would love you to, to show your support for like new and exciting things at kpfa and it's something we can turn around and and show management that the people who created the space for it on the air to say yeah that was a good call kpfa.org or 1-800-439-5732 join anna who just pledged from san francisco laura who also pledged from san francisco regina who pledged from albany charles in mill valley Pull your contribution with theirs. We're now at $505 raised, $295 to go in the next five minutes. KPFA.org or 1-800-439-5732. Jesse? One of the things we haven't talked about so far this hour is just the incredible encyclopedic knowledge of Vijay Prashad. When I did this interview with him, I knew that I could call him and I could ask him, hey, Vijay, Can you tell me about the Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya? Or can you tell me about Kwame Nkrumah's uh, decolonial movement to become the first country in Africa to decolonize from British rule? The thing that we haven't mentioned is if you pledge over $100 
to receive a gift of The Darker Nations by Vijay Prashad, you'll also get that full-length interview where with Vijay we talk again about the Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya and decolonization movements in Ghana, Malaya, Yemen, Sri Lanka, Rhodesia, which be- became Zimbabwe, and the Zambia when they decolonized, and more places, Ireland, etc. Um I also want to talk about one of the special ways that you can donate to us. And again, you can donate by going right now to kpfa.org or calling 1-800-439-5732. One of the special ways you can donate uh, uh, is by supporting us as a sustainer. That means you donate a designated amount of money each month. It means if you can afford any specific amount per month, we can rely on how that adds up over a year. A $10 monthly sustaining donation gives us $120 over 12 months. A $25 monthly donation would give us $350 would give us 600 for the year. Sustainer donations mean that it has less of an impact on your bank account in the short term, but we can count the full value of your donation throughout the year. And if we can raise our number of monthly sustainers, it could theoretically mean that we can lower our total financial goals and shorten these fund drives. We are trying to make $475,000 in our fall fund drive right now, and we need your help. You can go to our website, that's kpfa.org, and sign up to be a monthly sustainer at whatever amount is comfortable for you in your budget. Any amount really helps out, that's kpfa.org. And if you donate $10 a month or more, you can receive the gift of the 15th anniversary edition of The Darker Nations by Vijay Prashad. Brian? That's 1-800-439-5732, 1-800-HEY-KPFA or kpfa.org. Um, and that, as they say, is not all. Um, you'll also get KPFA's Fall 2022 Storytelling for Social Change Collection. That's the automatic thank you gift uh, that we have put together out of our own archives that we'll be sending out to everyone who pledges any amount. Uh, in that, you'll get a, a speech that Solomon Rushdie gave in 2012 about his life uh, in, in exile and under a fatwa. You'll get the late Barbara Ehrenreich speaking almost 30 years ago on third wave feminist movement activism. Um, and on top of the two of those, you will get the new Jim Crow presented when the book was was freshly released. Um, those go to anyone who pledges any amount from $25 to $2,500. They go out in the form of a link that you get instantly, and they go out in addition to anything else you pledge for. So if you pledged for the new edition of Vijay Prashad's The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World, you will get the book. Your $100 will count towards our challenge. You'll get the audio collection from KPFA, and you will get the uncut interview that we didn't have room for on the airwaves of this radio station. But you have one minute and 20 seconds to do it. KPFA.org or 1-800-439-5732. While I've been talking, Sam in San Francisco has moved us $175 closer to making that $800 challenge. That means we're at 120 to go. We're going to need your help because we're down to our final 60 seconds. KPFA.org or 1-800-439-5732. Vijay Prashad's The Darker Nations, A People's History of the Third World is in the featured gifts box when you pledge at kpfa.org. So is our Vijay Prashad package. Uh, You get his two newest books, this edition, plus Struggle Makes Us Human. We discount the combined pledge price to $175. And at that amount, in one fell swoop, you would bring in an extra $800 for KPFA. But this is the very last time we get to ask kpfa.org 1-800-439-5732 and if you need a mnemonic device to remember that number it's 1-800-HEY-KPFA thank you so much to everyone who pledged please keep pledging we are still $120 short on that challenge just out of time to ask and please stay tuned
Join KPFA in welcoming Pulitzer Prize winning author Chris Hedges to the First Congregational Church of Berkeley on Monday, September 26th to celebrate the release of The Greatest Evil is War. A blistering condemnation of war in all forms and for all reasons, says Publishers Weekly. This live in-person event will be hosted by Project Censored's Mickey Huff and will be Chris Hedges' only Bay Area appearance. So get your tickets now on eventbrite.com or by visiting kpfa.org slash events. Listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF 88.1 FM in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide, worldwide, worldwide at kpfa.org.